Throughout the development of Final Fantasy X, much care and attention was placed on the notion of connectivity. This saw the development of a collection of characters who had strong ties to one another, but this didn't just relate to the core group. Almost everyone in Spira was connected to one another in some shape or form, and in the broadest of senses, this applied to their shared fear of sin or their association with the various factions. But it was also much deeper rooted. It all seems clear and obvious now, but what's interesting is that this wasn't always planned to be the case. Around halfway through development, almost the entire cast of characters was scrapped. The writers just felt the previous setup wasn't conducive to telling the story they wanted, and only Tidus and Yuna survived the purge. As the new cast of characters built out, the writers took great care to build certain dynamics between them. Unlike the previous games, this led to a degree of familiarity being created with not just the cast, but also the world around them. This appeared through those connections, and they helped to make the narrative much more believable. People you'd meet would recognise party members, and the protagonists themselves also had a lot of shared history. But these connections extended even beyond that, and central to this was one of the game's main antagonists, Seymour Guado. In the realm of fiction, the creation of a foil for the protagonist is pretty commonplace. They are designed to have opposing traits, helping to show why someone might be good or bad, and to allow the audience to understand why certain choices are made on each side. But quite often, it's not always so cut and dry, and even though their paths may differ, many protagonists and antagonists, especially in the stories of Final Fantasy, have elements of their past that mirror one another. And this applies in numerous ways to Final Fantasy X. Tidus and Yuna are the clear protagonists, and Seymour is a clear antagonist, but the scriptwriters made sure to place numerous connections and similarities between the three characters so that those who looked a little deeper could acquire a degree of sympathy for Seymour, an individual who was ultimately driven to try and end all suffering as a result of his difficult and harsh childhood. We explored some of these elements in a previous video where we analysed the parallels that exist between the lives of Yuna and Seymour. It showed how Yuna could have easily gone down a different path had she not had such a supportive family network. And today, we're going to explore the parallels that exist between Tidus and Seymour, to show that even though they despised each other, based on their backgrounds, they were more similar than they would have wanted to realise. When the pair first encountered each other, their stations in life couldn't have been more disparate. As Seymour disembarked from his ship in Luca, it felt like the eyes of the world were upon him, there were those who were desperate to understand why Guado was accompanying Grand Maester Micah, but there were others who were in awe of his newfound status as a Maester of Yevon, following the death of his father, Jiskor Guado. But just a few weeks prior, their situations would have been rather different. Seymour would have been a mere high priest in the ranks of Yevon, receiving minimal fanfare, while in Dreams Anakin, Tidus would have been showered with praise and adulation from adoring Blitzball fans desperate for his attention. And this sparks the first parallel, that the fame we see both Tidus and Seymour enjoy had a one-to-one -one relationship with the fame that their fathers also enjoyed. Seymour's father, Jiskel, had also been a Maester of Yevon, promoted by Maester Micah as part of his sub-race appeasement policy, and Tidus' father, Jekt, had been a champion Blitzball player. Both had a profound impact on their respective worlds, and it was perhaps inevitable that their sons would end up walking the same path as they wanted to surpass what their predecessors had accomplished. But that path wasn't made easy for them. Although it manifested in different ways, both Tidus and Seymour were left emotionally scarred by decisions made by their parents. In the case of Tidus, Jekt had no idea how to be a father, and spent most of his time being drunk and abusive. Instead of fostering Tidus's interest in Blitzball and encouraging him, Jekt chose to constantly deride Tidus, beating his confidence into the ground and leaving him bitter and twisted. Unable to escape this destructive environment, Tidus came to resent his father, but this resentment turned to hatred as the abuse continued. When Jekt disappeared, it should have helped to alleviate the pressures Tidus felt, but it only made things worse. Instead of being abused in a direct capacity by a drunken idiot, he was abused through neglect, caused by his disappearance. Consumed with grief, Tidus's mother fell into a deep depression, so instead of looking after her son, much of her life revolved around pining for Jekt, hoping that one day her lover would return. Such was the seriousness of her condition that Tidus's mother passed away a year after Jekt's disappearance, but even though she had neglected him, Tidus chose to position the blame yet again towards his father, as if he'd stuck around, he would have at least had one parent who would have cared about him. Seymour's situation was a bit more nuanced. 
Jisco Guado had always been keen to try and strengthen relationships between the Guado and the humans, and such was his fondness for humans that he even entered into a relationship with one. But there was no way he could have predicted the vitriol that arose following the birth of his son. The Guado were incensed that he would father a child that was half human, and as their leader, this pained Jisco greatly. But what pained him more was that the only solution he could think of to appease his people and stop them from rising up against him was to banish his partner and his son from Guado Salon, forcing them to live in exile at Baj Temple. In an official sense, Jiskel declared that Seymour had chosen isolation to focus on becoming a summoner, but everyone knew the truth, and it must have made Seymour feel horrible that he was so unwanted. It meant both Tidus and Seymour experienced early pain owing to loss, with neither having their fathers around and this led to resentment and hatred. But what followed was a period where they were both able to excel and explore their natural affinities as child prodigies. Tidus was able to start experimenting with Blitzball, and with Jekt gone, he was able to enjoy the sport, allowing his natural talents to grow to the point that he became the star player of the Zanuck and Aves. Seymour was able to explore his natural affinity with magic. When the time was right, he started down the path to defeat Sin, despite being only 10 years old. And even though the path was fraught with difficulty, and many, far more experienced summoners had failed, Seymour was able to complete his pilgrimage. What's curious about these two scenarios though, is that even though both their fathers were a common source of ire, they also served as the main motivation for the journeys they would take, it's just that neither Tidus or Seymour were aware of it. And this is where they differ from Yuna, as Braska had no master plan for Yuna, and would have never wanted her to follow the same path that he did. Before sacrificing his life to become Braska's final Aeon, Jekt requested that Oren look over his son. This saw Oren venture to Dream Zanakend, and he was given the objective of bringing Tidus to Spira when the time was right. Until then, his job was to oversee Tidus and ensure that he was developing in the right way. In the case of Seymour, Jiskel had told his people that his son would defeat Sin. He believed this was the only way Spira would accept Seymour, and it would also further his goal of fostering relationships between the Guado and the humans. Seymour's mother was then given the responsibility of ensuring that this happened at the cost of her own life. And in a weird coincidence, should Seymour have followed through, Jekt would have replaced Seymour's mother as Sin, as both parents were used as their summoner's final Aeon. As children, this means the parallels between Tidus and Seymour were quite clear, but their paths started to diverge when Seymour chose not to follow through with his father's plan, as instead of using the final Aeon, he chose to return to Baj Temple. This left Seymour in an odd position, as there was nobody to guide him, and he spent eight years in isolation at Baj Temple until his father lifted his exile at the age of 18. When Seymour returned to Guado Salon, he chose to become a man of the faith. He was driven to improve sentiments towards the Guado, no doubt inspired by his father failing to do so in any meaningful way. This saw him join Yevon as a priest, and he was later promoted to the position of high priest at Makalania Temple. But all the while, he was plotting his main objective, breaking the cycle and ending all suffering by becoming Sin. Around the same time, Tidus started on the path laid out for him by his father. This was also geared around attempting to break the cycle and ending all suffering, but instead of becoming Sin, Jekt wanted Tidus to defeat Sin and prevent it from coming back. Under Oren's guidance, this saw Tidus become Yuna's guardian, and for much of the journey he was left in the dark as to what her pilgrimage actually meant. Oren needed him to see the sacrifice and futility, so that when the time came, he would be prepared to fight back and do what he could not. Following the defeat of Unaleska, Tidus then joined Una and continued to support her, fulfilling his father's wishes even though he despised him and knew it would ultimately cost him his own life. Both of these paths saw Tidus and Seymour attempt to save Spira, and in both instances the relationship they had with Una would have also been pivotal to their success. Tidus needed to form a strong connection with Yuna, so that when the time came, they would lean on each other to push through. Tidus initially did this due to his moral compass, but this ended up blossoming into a much deeper connection between the pair. The irony is that Seymour also wanted to foster a deep and meaningful connection with Yuna, proposing that they be married and that he become her final Aeon, but the difference was that he only ever meant it to be a superficial relationship. Due to his nihilism, Seymour cared little for consequences and only saw the end goal. He cared little for how Yuna might be affected and only targeted her due to her lineage. It's why, even though both Seymour and Tidus killed their fathers, their reasons for doing so were very different. 
Seymour knew that Jiskel needed to be slain so that his plan could be realised. Unlike his father, Seymour knew that he needed to improve public sentiment towards the Guado, and he did this with brutal and unethical efficiency. The usurping of Jiskel was just the first step, and it was followed by the theatrics at Luca, his gate crashing of Operation Meehan, and the murder of Maester Keenock. Seymour also knew that if he could convince Yuna to marry him, there would be almost nothing that could stop him. But he didn't count on the intervention of an outsider who, through channeling similar childhood trauma, was guided by Oran to join the side of virtue instead of going down the same dark path. In many ways though, it feels like the choice made by Seymour's mother is the most pivotal. She was driven by her desire to make the people of Spira love her son, using sin as a way of seeking redemption. It wasn't too dissimilar from Braska, who was shunned by both Yevon and the Albed, but was celebrated as a hero upon his victory. The main difference though, is that it was Braska who made the choice. When Seymour undertook his pilgrimage, he was only 10 years old, and it must have put an unbelievable amount of pressure on his shoulders. Had Seymour's mother chosen to fight against Jiskel's plan and stayed with Seymour to guide him, much as Oren was there to guide Tidus, who knows, perhaps Seymour could have become a productive member of society, and he may even have undertaken the pilgrimage of his own accord once he understood more about what it meant. It's what makes Final Fantasy X such a fascinating game, and this serves as another example that could be explored in so many different ways, and we hope you all found it very interesting. If you did, then please feel free to hit that like button, share this video around, and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel. Alright guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.